The man known to history as King Henry VIII of England was born on the 28th of June 1491 at Greenwich Palace just outside of London. His father was King Henry VII, the first monarch of the House of Tudor, King of England and Lord of Ireland. He reigned from 1485 when he seized the throne of England at the end of the Wars of the Roses to his death in 1509 when he was succeeded by his second son and namesake Henry. Henry VIII's mother was Elizabeth of York, the daughter of King Edward IV, who had ruled England for most of the period between 1461 and 1483. As a Yorkist princess, her marriage to Henry VII allowed reconciliation and healing between the two great houses of York and Lancaster after years of civil war. She bore her husband seven children. Before Henry was born, a boy and a girl named Arthur and Margaret had appeared in 1486 and 1489. Three daughters and another son would follow after Henry, though of these only Mary, born in 1496, would live long. Elizabeth, Edmund and Catherine all died in infancy or their early childhood years. As the second son of his parents, Henry was never expected to be king. Instead, that duty would fall to his older brother Arthur, the Prince of Wales. Henry consequently grew up as the royal spare rather than the heir. He had several tutors at the palace at Eltham where he was raised, who taught him grammar, rhetoric, history, philosophy, logic, arithmetic, and languages including French, Spanish, Italian, Latin, and Greek. Henry showed an equal facility for both athletics and music. He was said to have composed music of his own at various times throughout his life and, although it is difficult to remember when considering the obese individual with a debilitating leg ulcer which he became in later life, as a young man, he was an athletic individual. The poet John Skelton educated Henry in his moral duties, while he also developed a fairly pious Roman Catholicism. His mother, Elizabeth, taught him to write from an early age, something evinced by the similarities in their handwriting styles. By the time he learned to write, he already held several major titles, including those of Duke of York, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Earl Marshal of England and Warden of the Scottish Marshes. He might not have been the heir, but Henry VII certainly honoured his younger son with many titles. This video is sponsored by Manscaped.com, the global men's lifestyle brand that is revolutionising the landscape of men's grooming. When you've got the confidence of more than 10 million men worldwide, it's pretty clear that Manscaped has mastered the art of producing superior men's grooming and hygiene tools to look after your family jewels. Manscaped provides unmatched quality and value with their latest grooming and hygiene bundle, the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, featuring the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra electric trimmer with dual skin safe blade heads. First, the upgraded trimmer blade cuts through hair with ease. Then there's the foil blade, designed to leave you with a finish that's irresistibly sleek and utterly bare. With the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra Kit, the Weed Whacker 2.0 Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer is included, meaning you can say goodbye to bothersome nose hairs. And the Crop Soother and Crop Preserver provides essential moisture and soothing relief for ultimate comfort after shave. Plus, when you purchase the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, you'll receive two free gifts. Join the 10 million men worldwide who've put their confidence in Manscaped for all things grooming and hygiene. Head over to manscaped.com and use my promo code manscaped.com slash profiles and you'll get 20% off and free international shipping and two free gifts. Trust me when I say this, fellas, your nether regions will thank you. Henry was the subject of exceptional admiration as a boy, 
as some of the most celebrated intellectuals in both England and Europe, including Sir Thomas More, the famed author of Utopia, and the Dutch philosopher Desiderius Erasmus, the most celebrated scholar of Northern Europe in the early 16th century, marveled publicly at his intelligence and charisma. More wrote about Henry in his poetry, calling him a savior and a new messiah, though royal flattery was a commonplace of the early modern period. Both More and Erasmus met Henry as a young man in 1499 at Eltham Palace. Other than this, Henry spent a largely happy childhood surrounded by his mother, sisters and paternal grandmother, all of whom openly adored him. Indeed, some historians have speculated that it was Henry's childhood, spent in the center of a circle of adoring women, which made him both an individual who veered towards passionate romance, but one who was also possessed of a severe petulance when he did not get his way. On the 2nd of April, 1502, Henry's older brother, Arthur, died, possibly of tuberculosis or of the mysterious sweating sickness, a disease which historians have speculated was either a strain of influenza or a hantavirus of some kind. The death of the heir was in many ways the defining moment in Henry's life. It was absolutely vital that a smooth succession occurred when Henry VII died. He had claimed the throne after defeating the Yorkist usurper, King Richard III, at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. Not long before this, Richard had seized the throne by imprisoning his nephews and, in all likelihood, having them murdered in the Tower of London. This brutal act on Richard's part had ensured that many people in England were happy to support Henry Tudor's cause in 1485. Yet there also is no doubt that the House of Tudor had a very tenuous claim to the throne of England, being descended through a line of the great 14th century King of England, Edward III, one which was widely considered to be illegitimate, as it stemmed from Edward's son, John of Gaunt's marriage to Catherine Swinford, and the children born out of wedlock from that marriage. Moreover, the Tudors were also largely a Welsh family, not something which blocked their path to the throne legally, but hardly something which the ancient noble houses of England would have viewed well. Unsurprisingly, there had been numerous revolts against the Tudors in the late 1480s and into the 1490s as Henry was growing up. For Henry VII, it was all too clear that a new rival for the throne could emerge at any time, and so it was vitally important that a smooth transition of power occurred when he himself died. Thus, the death of Arthur in 1502 was a major blow. The succession now rested on young Henry's shoulders. This concern for having a male heir and ensuring a smooth succession would hang like a shadow over Henry's entire life. Henry VII now took the education in hand of his ten-year-old son, who was quickly anointed as the Prince of Wales. This was the beginning of a battle between father and son, as, while Arthur was still alive, Henry had been somewhat ignored by the king, but now that Arthur was dead, and Henry was the Prince of Wales, the dour and forbidding Henry VII became heavily involved in his son's daily life. This soon resulted in many a tussle of wills between the two, chief amongst which was a disagreement over Henry's passion for jousting and other martial sports, things which Henry VII understandably prohibited him from engaging in now that they could endanger the life of the future king. Young Henry was embarrassed at being restricted to competing in unarmed training exercises only, whilst his friends were able to both exhibit their skills and defend their manly honor in the joust. On top of this, over the next few years, father and son drifted apart as Henry VII became an increasingly unpopular ruler 
on account of his financial policies and his employment of a close coterie of secretive advisors who alienated much of the political nation from the king. While Prince Henry was looked towards as the young king-in-waiting who held out promise of a brighter future. While Henry VII's prudent government might have earned him the resentment of his subjects, he would, ultimately, put the English state on a sound financial footing and bequeath a large surplus to his son one day. Another major feature of the years after Arthur's death concerned his widow and the issue of Henry marrying. In 1501, before his untimely demise, Arthur had married Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of King Ferdinand II of Aragon and Queen Isabella I of Castile, whose own union had united the two major kingdoms of Spain. The marriage of Arthur and Catherine had been designed to foster an alliance between England and Spain. Arthur's death seemed to scupper this, though almost immediately thereafter, Henry VII had begun corresponding with Catherine's parents in Spain about the possibility of Catherine now marrying Prince Henry. The negotiations wound on interminably through the 1500s, or throughout which time Catherine remained in England. The issues around it concerned Catherine's dowry or marriage portion that would be paid to the English crown by her parents, and also whether or not Catherine and Arthur had consummated their marriage. If they had, Henry could not marry Catherine according to canon law. The deliberations about the proposed marriage were still ongoing seven years later when Henry VII died on the 21st of April, 1509. When his father died, the Prince of Wales was immediately proclaimed as King Henry VIII of England. An atmosphere of hope and joy prevailed amongst the nobles, courtiers, gentry and commoners alike throughout England, and many predicted the beginning of a golden age for England as the tall, athletic and handsome Henry, with his intelligence, charm and humour, ascended the throne at 17 years of age. He would soon be married. Only three weeks after his father's death, on the 11th of June, 1509, Henry married Catherine in a brief private ceremony at the Church of the Observant Friars just outside of Greenwich Palace. She was six years older than Henry, and there were lingering issues about the validity of the marriage in canon law, but a papal dispensation was granted to allow it to proceed. Despite how contentious it would become in later years, Henry and Catherine's marriage was a happy one initially. He truly respected her, probably more so than any of his other wives. For her part, Catherine was a devoted wife, even long after Henry had ceased wanting her to be. Two weeks after the royal wedding on the 24th of June, 1509, Henry and Catherine were crowned King and Queen of England in Westminster Abbey. The procession route from the Palace of Westminster to the Abbey was decorated with cloth of gold and exquisite tapestries, and both Henry and Catherine were resplendent. Henry, in a jewel-decorated cloth of gold coat with a red velvet ermine-trimmed robe, and Catherine, dressed in a rich mantle of cloth of tissue, with a silk circlet of golden pearl on her head, her long auburn hair unbound. The Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warham, anointed the royal couple with holy oil and crowned them both to cries of, By that, by that, Rex, or Long live the King. It was the last time that a joint coronation of a king and queen would take place in England for nearly two centuries, with most of the six monarchs that followed being unmarried at the time of their coronation. After the initial ceremony, two days of feasting and armed tournaments followed, including the jousting tourneys which Henry's father had so disapproved of. The first years of Henry's reign were good ones. 
The court was purposefully modelled after those of the warrior kings of the medieval period, and Henry and his courtiers enjoyed both watching and participating in the frequent rounds of jousts and tournaments. Unlike his father, the new monarch spent extravagantly on clothing, jewels and fine furnishings, while the richest foods were served daily, often with as many as seven courses served at mealtimes. There also seemed to be good news immediately for securing the line of succession, with Catherine visibly pregnant by the winter of 1509. It was, however, the beginning of a turbulent natal history. At the very end of January 1510, Catherine miscarried. She was carrying a baby girl. One year later, in January 1511, Catherine gave birth to a son, Prince Henry, who tragically only survived for seven weeks before passing away. The cause of his death is unclear. Two further children came and went in the autumn of 1513 and the early winter of 1514, both sons, both being either stillbirths or children who died within hours or days of their birth. The information is not entirely clear. Henry's famous reputation as a tyrant might lead some to believe that Catherine's initial failure to produce an heir for England may have been a point of contention between the Queen and her husband. In fact, Henry and Catherine's marriage continued in a seemingly warm and supportive state for several years. Henry appears to have been both patient and understanding with Catherine's struggle to give him an heir. There are good reasons for this. In 16th century England, child mortality was much more common than it is today, and a wife, especially a noble or royal wife, might have a dozen or more children to compensate for the sad fact that many would not survive infancy or their childhood years. Depending on circumstances, between one-third and half of pregnancies would result in miscarriages, stillbirths, or infant mortality. And whilst these occurrences were considered tragic, Catherine's demonstrated ability to conceive easily was actually an encouraging sign that she would eventually give birth to a healthy son and heir. In the meantime, the young royal couple demonstrated impressive collaboration in the governance and management of England's affairs. Henry forgave many of his father's debtors and made efforts to bury the enmity that existed with those who had clashed with his father. His charm and magnanimity won him the support of both the nobility and the people. As well as this, Catherine was beloved for her intelligence, strength, piety and devotion to the English people. When Henry launched a joint invasion of France, along with the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I in the summer of 1513, he left Catherine to serve as regent in his absence, a clear sign of the trust he placed in her. The war had come about as both an extension of the Italian wars being fought between France and Spain, the dominance over the Italian peninsula, and also Henry's desire to reignite the Hundred Years' War which had seen England try to conquer much of France in the 14th and 15th centuries. In Italy, Pope Julius II and King Louis XII of France were at war over the Italian states ruled by the papacy. Pope Julius excommunicated Louis, forming a coalition of nations. To sway the young Henry to join them in the League, he sent him barrels of Italian wine, a gold-covered rose, and a shipment of Parmesan cheeses. In England, Archbishop Warham had preached for peace and against the evils of war, though eventually Henry had decided differently. In this, he had the support of the Lord Chancellor Thomas Wolsey, a leading religious figure in England and soon to be a Cardinal of the Church. He was also the chief minister of Henry's government throughout much of the 1510s and 1520s and an immensely powerful figure. 
On the 28th of June, 1513, with the decision for war already taken, the King and Queen arrived at Dover Castle in Kent. Henry crossed the English Channel the following day to join the fight against King Louis of France. For the first time in nearly a hundred years, since the glory days of King Henry V and the Battle of Agincourt, an English king would now seek to extend his dominion on the continent, which, after the losses in the final decades of the Hundred Years' War, had been reduced to nothing more than a small enclave around Calais. Henry's first victory was at Tarouane, followed by a triumph at the Battle of the Spurs, so named because the mounted French knights fled the field so quickly using their spurs to push their horses onwards as quickly as they could. Whilst Henry pursued his dreams of English martial glory in France, Catherine was busy confronting an invasion of England by the Scots, the perennial ally of the French, under King James IV. Within two months of Henry's invasion of France, King James invaded England in support of his French allies. Catherine, however, proved equal to the challenge in Henry's absence. Catherine was personally involved in the military mobilization and strategy for England's defense when the English, heavily represented by longbow men and led by Thomas Howard, the Earl of Surrey, defeated the Scots at the Battle of Flodden on the 9th of September, 1513. At the battle, the English forces were victorious over a greater Scottish force, and James IV perished on the battlefield, along with as many as 17,000 of his 40,000-strong army, whilst the English, in contrast, lost only 1,500 of their 26,000-strong host. The Queen, in writing to Henry after the victory, praised him for his successes abroad and sent, as a token of her own triumph, a shred of the Scottish King's coat to add to the King's banners, as his army carried on to take parts of Flanders, as well as Tournay, where Henry built a great castle, a symbol of what he believed to be his burgeoning continental empire. Three years later, and seven years into their marriage, Henry and Catherine's patience was rewarded when, on the 18th of February 1516, Catherine gave birth to a daughter, Princess Mary, the future Queen Mary I. She would be the king and queen's only child to live beyond infancy and into adulthood. England rejoiced. Mary's birth and survival, seven years into the reign, contained the promise that a male heir might follow before long. At the time, no woman had ever been Queen of England in her own right, although, unlike in countries like France, where the Salic law prohibited female monarchs, Mary could theoretically succeed her father one day, and Henry appeared to treat his daughter as a true Princess of Wales. He even sent her to live at Ludlow Castle, where she was established with her own miniature court as was the tradition for the heir to the English throne. However, while Henry loved his daughter and referred to her as my pearl in the world, he still pined for a male heir. As the years went by, this would become an obsession which clouded his judgment and slowly turned the loving husband and valiant king, who had promised so much in 1509, into a tyrant who tore his own kingdom apart in search of a son. During the course of the 1520s, it became apparent that Catherine would not produce a son and heir. She turned 40 in December 1525, and thereafter her chances of delivering any further children, let alone a boy who was healthy, became slimmer and slimmer. Long before that time, Henry began to take mistresses with more regularity. Such behavior was not necessarily an indication of his waning interest in his wife. Most kings in early modern Europe had one or multiple mistresses. 
In June 1519, one of these, Elizabeth Blount, a lady-in-waiting to the Queen, gave birth to Henry's son. The King acknowledged the boy as his own child, and he was named Henry Fitzroy. Henry after his father, while Fitzroy literally means son of the King. Henry lavished attention and titles on his son, but under English law, he was illegitimate and could not succeed his father. Still, with the birth of Henry Fitzroy, Henry had proven that he could father a son. While the king never openly blamed Catherine for her perceived failure to produce a boy, the years following the birth of his illegitimate son saw a gradual decline in Henry and Catherine's previously happy relationship. His dynastic troubles aside, the first ten years of Henry's reign clearly reflected his ambitious pursuit of glory. Henry set out to make England the equal of both France and Spain in wealth, power and prestige. Early on in his reign, he sponsored the construction of dockyards, warehouses and shipyards in coastal ports and sourced huge amounts of timber from the forests of Sussex and Kent for the construction of a large fleet. Henry's father had become king in the very infancy of Europe's Age of Exploration. Not to be outdone by the Spanish, he had begun a process of naval expansion and sponsored the first major English voyages of discovery. It is, for example, often overlooked that it was a pilot in English employ, John Cabot, who became the first early modern European to reach the mainland of North America in 1497, while Columbus was still island hopping in the Caribbean. But the English navy remained small by 1509. Henry VIII set about changing this, and by the 1540s it had been expanded to approximately 50 ships. Henry also pioneered a revolution in English international diplomacy. In 1518, with the threat of a Turkish invasion of southeastern Europe looming, a prospect which alarmed all Christendom, Henry signed a non-aggression pact with Charles V, the new Holy Roman Emperor and Queen Catherine's nephew, along with Francis I, King of France. The agreement was the beginning of several summits which took place over the next two years between the three European powers, largely planned and orchestrated by Henry's chief minister, Cardinal Wolsey. The most impressive of these diplomatic meetings was unquestionably the Field of Cloth of Gold, which took place in France near Calais from the 7th to the 24th of June 1520. At the summit, Henry and Francis signed a pledge of perpetual friendship and peace. Princess Mary was betrothed to the Dauphin of France. All in attendance enjoyed a week of feasting, drinking, entertainment and jousting contests amid the exquisite tents made from gold cloth. However, despite the pomp and ceremony of the Field of Cloth of Gold, the alliance between Henry and Francis would soon collapse, as shortly afterwards Cardinal Wolsey negotiated an alliance with Charles V of Spain, who declared war on France later in 1521, starting the Italian War of 1521 to 1526, into which England was dragged, the second of three wars which Henry would fight with France. However, the bulk of the fighting would play out in Italy between the French and Spanish there. Henry was determined to be remembered as a prince of intellect and virtue, as well as one skilled at statesmanship. The growing furore over the writings of Martin Luther in Germany from 1517 onwards and the Protestant Reformation which it inspired soon presented him with an opportunity to demonstrate his learning. Luther had emerged as a grave critic of the papacy in Rome and the wealth and power of the church in general, arguing 
that the corruption within it needed to be rooted out and a new form of Christianity established, one in which churches would be stripped of their idolatrous wealth, the mass would be performed in the vernacular tongues rather than in Latin, and people would be encouraged to actually read the Bible themselves and engage with Scripture. Henry was a doctrinal Catholic who liked the power, ceremony, and tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. In response to the heresy emanating from Central Europe, in 1521 he composed a text entitled Assertio Septem Sacramentorum, or The Defense of the Seven Sacraments. In this, Henry attacked Luther's ideas, defended sacred Catholic practices, and affirmed in all religious matters the supremacy of the Pope over the Church in Europe. Henry even dedicated the text to Pope Leo X, who, in recognition of his service to the Church, gave Henry the title Fide Defensor, meaning Defender of the Faith. Whether Henry actually wrote all of the defense of the seven sacraments remains a matter of debate. Thomas More might well have aided him and certainly commented on drafts of the text. By the mid-1520s, Henry's marital situation was becoming more strained. He was no longer the popular teenage king, but was still a relatively young man in his thirties. His thoughts had seemingly not turned of their own accord to potentially divorcing Catherine and seeking to remarry to a woman that might sire a son. Instead, it took the arrival of Anne Boleyn to the Tudor court at this time to lead Henry down this path. Anne was a daughter of Thomas Boleyn, Henry's former ambassador to France. She had recently returned from the French court with her father and was much admired for her cosmopolitan air, her style, wit, and charm. Her year of birth is unclear, though it was probably 1501, making her a woman entering her mid-twenties at the time Henry became infatuated by her. For the first few months of their courtship, there seemed to be no question of Henry casting off his wife. Anne knew how to play the king, though. She refused to become his mistress so long as he was married, insisting that she would only commit in such a way to her future husband. Over time, Henry became more and more obsessed, and his letters to Anne, some of which survive, are full of passionate declarations of his love and desire for her. Generally, Anne Boleyn has been depicted as a grasping political climber who usurped Queen Catherine's legitimate place. However, there is no evidence that she encouraged Henry's interest in her initially. Rather, she reportedly made an abrupt departure from court in the spring of 1527, returning to her family's home at Hever Castle. While some might accuse her of playing a skillful game of manipulation, it seems unlikely that a young woman like Anne, from a respectable but hardly powerful family, could have imagined that she would become anything more than Henry's temporary mistress. There is almost certainly no possibility that she imagined herself as queen one day when Henry started courting her. Moreover, a liaison with the king would possibly compromise her own future marriage prospects. Nevertheless, after her abrupt departure from court, Henry continued writing to Anne and sending her gifts. In time, Anne began to respond to Henry with feelings of her own, and the two carried on their relationship quite publicly at court after she made her return there. There is no way to know exactly for how long Anne refused Henry's sexual advances. However, the fact that Anne did not become pregnant throughout the nearly seven years of their courtship suggests she stayed chaste. While Henry and Anne were intimate with one another in other ways, the likelihood is that they did not sleep together prior to 1532. In 1527, 
A year or so after he began courting Anne, Henry decided to seek a divorce from Catherine so he could marry Boleyn. He and his counsellors soon latched onto a potentially legitimate reason for seeking an annulment of his near two decades old marriage. When Henry had first married Catherine, he had done so over objections that she had previously been married to his deceased brother Arthur, and that their brief marriage had possibly been consummated. This would have been in breach of canon law, as Leviticus 20.21 20, reads, quote, If any man should take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. They will be childless. In order to sidestep this issue, it had been argued back in the 1500s that Catherine and Arthur had never actually been together as man and wife, thus allowing Henry to marry Catherine. Now, 18 years after they were first married, Henry very conveniently started to have a fit of conscience. It was soon being argued in England that the marriage in 1509 had been a breach of natural religious law after all. On these grounds, Henry began petitioning Pope Clement VII in Rome for an annulment to his first marriage, whereby he could then marry Anne. The king would spend more than half a decade pursuing what became known at court and in English political circles as his great matter. He would change English political and religious history in the process. The process began with a direct appeal to Pope Clement VII. It was not unknown for popes to grant annulments to marriages on rather dubious legal grounds, where the marriage was one which had not resulted in a male heir. This could avoid disruptive succession disputes and wars. However, there was no possibility of Clement doing so in this case. Right around the time he began petitioning Clement in 1527, the Spanish and Imperial armies of Emperor Charles V, Catherine of Aragon's nephew, had sacked and occupied the city of Rome. With the Pope a virtual prisoner of Charles, there was no way he could agree to annul the marriage. Henry then turned to Cardinal Wolsey, who had never failed him and who owed literally all he had to the king. Wolsey was not born to the nobility. The son of a butcher from Ipswich, he was originally an obscure chaplain until, under Henry's patronage, he was made a bishop, then archbishop, and finally a cardinal and papal legate in England. To Wolsey would fall the task in the late 1520s of resolving the king's great matter. Wolsey had not only been Henry's Lord Chancellor, he had also been his mentor, but in time his failure to procure the sought-after divorce would lead to his ruin. The cardinal, Working with Cardinal Campeggio, a special legate appointed by the Pope, set up a legatine court to determine Henry's great matter. But the court was unable to reach a decision and instead ruled that the issue should be decided by the College of Cardinals in Rome. It is unclear whether Wolsey truly wanted to give Henry his desire or if he saw the danger of allowing the king to divorce his famously pious Catholic wife and marry Anne, who was rumoured to be sympathetic to the small but growing community of Lutheran Protestant reformers that had emerged in London, Oxford and Cambridge. Whatever his intentions, the failure of the Legatine court led to Wolsey's downfall as Henry commanded his arrest and imprisonment citing the treasonous tone of letters Wolsey had written to Vatican officials. However, the Cardinal in fact died of natural causes on his way to London before Henry could ever have him executed. Henry also took possession of Hampton Court, the fabulous palace which Wolsey had personally transformed from a modest country house, setting it up as a royal residence thereafter. Following the Cardinal's downfall, 
Henry did not sit idly by waiting for the Pope to change his mind. Instead, he began to canvass the opinion of theologians at Europe's universities, asking them to study, deliberate, and pronounce a verdict on the merits of his case for divorce. However, Henry would be disappointed twice more, as the majority of university theologians and, later, the College of Cardinals would decide in favor of Queen Catherine, declaring the king's first marriage valid in law. It is unclear when Henry first began to consider repudiating the Pope's authority in England, thus removing the obstacle to his divorce. Anne Boleyn's influence as a Lutheran sympathizer and reformer is entirely plausible, as is the influence of Thomas Cromwell, a figure who had risen as a servant of Wolsey's, but who survived the Cardinal's downfall and inveigled his way into Henry's confidence around 1529. He would come to dominate the government in the 1530s. Alternatively, the key figure in the king's move towards splitting from Rome was an otherwise little-known clergyman and theology professor from Cambridge by the name of Thomas Cranmer. According to Cranmer, who was at that time a moderate Lutheran, but would become a more radical Calvinist in years to come, kings were anointed by God and answered only to God. Therefore, Henry should not have had to pursue his divorce through legal channels. He certainly did not need the permission of the Pope to divorce his wife. This emboldened Henry to formally break with the Roman Catholic Church and pursue a claim to be the supreme head of the Church of England. It would take nearly two years for Henry to achieve this over the resistance of both Parliament and the English clergy, but by 1532, Henry secured his wish and was formally acknowledged as the supreme head of the Church in England. After being browbeaten, Parliament had legislated a full break with the Pope, stopping virtually all payments of ecclesiastical dues to Rome. Henry made Thomas Cranmer, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, the most powerful ecclesiastical appointment in the country, empowering him to oversee enforcement of the new supremacy and the split with Rome. Then, in May of 1533, Archbishop Cranmer finally declared Henry's marriage to Catherine invalid and granted the king his long-desired divorce. By that time, Henry had already been remarried for four months, having wed Anne Boleyn in a secret ceremony on the 25th of January, 1533. Anne was pregnant by then, though she and the king probably did not know this on the day of their union, as on the 7th of September 1533, just seven and a half months after their marriage, Anne gave birth to their first child. Though Henry expressed his delight, he cannot but have been disappointed that it was a baby girl. They named her Elizabeth, after Henry's long-deceased mother. Henry well understood the enormity of what he had done, and he moved swiftly to consolidate his new powers. There were two issues. Firstly, Catherine of Aragon was still widely popular and the majority of the English people sympathized with her cause and that of her and Henry's daughter, Mary, who was now being legally excluded from the succession. Secondly, the majority of the English people were still staunch Roman Catholics and viewed figures like Cranmer suspiciously as clerics who were now intent on exploiting the king's marital drama to impose a Protestant Reformation in England. Henry knew he would have to establish control quickly. His answer was the Act of Supremacy, which he proposed following his marriage to Anne and which Parliament passed in 1534. The Act required all the king's subjects to swear an oath recognizing Henry as supreme head of the church and affirming the legality of the king's marriage to Anne Boleyn. Refusal to swear the oath would be considered treason 
and all office holders and political figures would be required to swear it. Many refused. Chief amongst them, Henry's old friend and mentor, Sir Thomas More. More had largely retired from court and public life in general in 1532, dismayed at the drift of political events, though he had been quite happy to exploit Wolsey's downfall to become Lord Chancellor a few years earlier. As of 1535, he remained one of only a few of Henry's prominent subjects who still had not taken the oath. His refusal to do so soon resulted in Moore being imprisoned in the tower. At his trial, when it was clear that he would be found guilty, he loudly affirmed the authority of the Pope and rejected Henry's supremacy over the Church of England. For this, he was sentenced to death for treason, a crime which carried the gruesome penalty of being hung, drawn, and quartered. It is a small testament to his remembrance of More's friendship and service to him that Henry commuted his sentence to beheading. The punishment was carried out on the 6th of July, 1535, before which More declared in a loud, clear voice that he died, quote, the king's good servant, and God's first. Henry had finally removed all who seemed openly opposed to the new order. The death of Catherine of Aragon from natural causes on the 7th of January 1536 appeared to remove the last barrier to the legitimacy of Henry and Anne's marriage. But a dark cloud still hovered. Anne had become pregnant two more times in quick succession following the birth of Elizabeth, yet both pregnancies had resulted in miscarriages. As this occurred, Henry and Anne's relationship was growing increasingly strained due to the Queen's perceived failure to adjust to her new role of wife. As Henry's mistress, she might have been allowed a certain amount of license to speak and act as she pleased. Her prolonged refusal to sleep with Henry likely put her in a rather dominant position as well. However, as Henry's wife and as queen, she was expected to act in a different fashion, roles to which she did not easily adjust. All of this took place against the backdrop of her miscarriages and the fact that Henry's second marriage was proving no more successful in terms of producing a male heir than his first. In the spring of 1536, after another miscarriage, accusations of Anne's alleged adultery abounded at court. Henry chose to believe them. Private interrogations of the Queen's household elicited fantastic claims of her degeneracy with several individuals accusing her of conspiring against the king, adultery, and even incest with her own brother, George. At a speedy trial that was cobbled together, which Anne was not permitted to be present at, she was found guilty, and on the 31st of May, 1536, Anne Boleyn was taken to the scaffold and beheaded. With dignity, she spoke briefly and movingly of her love for the king, her sins of pride and her desire that the people would pray for her. The exact circumstances of her trial have been widely debated and even half a millennium later there is no agreement as to whether or not the charges against her were completely or only partially fabricated in order to remove her from the scene as quickly as possible. What we do know is that within 24 hours of his second wife's execution, Henry was already betrothed to one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, Lady Jane Seymour. She soon became his third wife. While Lady Jane, like her family, had sworn the oath of supremacy, she was a pious Catholic. As a result, many people expected that now, with Anne Boleyn gone, Henry would backtrack on some of his radical religious policies. However, the reforms, if anything, accelerated 
and Henry ordered Thomas Cromwell to begin the dissolution of England's monasteries around this time. In 1536, abbeys, shrines and monasteries throughout England and Wales were suddenly taken under state ownership. The dissolution of the 800 or so monasteries was undertaken for two reasons. Firstly, the Protestant reformers who had managed to acquire positions of power in England during the early 1530s, under cover of aiding the king in his great matter, were opposed to monasticism in general. Protestants viewed the religious orders as worldly organizations that had helped the Pope corrupt the word of God and argued that monasticism had no basis in religious doctrine. Secondly, the king was convinced that dissolving the monasteries was a good idea because it would lead to an absolutely enormous financial windfall as their precious books, gold chalices and other valuables were sold off along with their lands. With this money, Henry speculated he could clear his debts and initiate a new war with France, the rightful duty of any English monarch. The dissolution was not implemented without resistance. In the autumn of 1536, a massive uprising broke out in the north of England. This became known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. Henry only quelled it through attempts at appeasement followed by brutal reprisals. Marching in the name of the king, carrying banners depicting the five wounds of Christ, the rebels demanded the restoration of the abbeys, the revival of sacred Catholic ceremonies, and the dismissal of the king's devious ministers that had led him astray in recent times. The rebels numbered an incredible 40,000 strong, the largest army yet seen on English soil in Tudor times. To appease the mob, Henry initially promised them pardons if they dispersed and ended their rebellion. However, when further disturbances broke out, Henry unleashed a brutal repression and hundreds of rebel leaders were arrested and executed. Indeed, even his own family were not spared Henry's wrath, as when the wife who replaced Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, begged him on her knees to restore the abbeys, he exploded with, quote, Get up! Do not presume to meddle in my affairs. Remember Anne. The desecration of the monasteries continued apace for four more years. The confiscated wealth briefly made Henry one of the richest monarchs in Europe, while internationally England was viewed as a pariah state by many, a country which had adopted the hated Protestant faith, the emergence of which was leading to religious wars and inquisitions all over Europe. Henry was unperturbed, though. Instead, the king resolved to use his newly appropriated fortune to build up the country's defences, ordering the construction of hundreds of forts and gun emplacements along the English coast, the materials for which often came from the monasteries and abbeys themselves. Making England a veritable island fortress in the process, which, combined with the growing English navy, formed the blueprint for English defensive and offensive strategies for many years to come. Between 1536 and 1539, Henry was also convinced by Cranmer and others to pursue other avenues to reinforce the new religious life of England. For instance, the Ten Articles of Faith were published in 1536, an English translation of the Bible appeared in 1537, as well as the Institution of the Christian Man, colloquially known as the Bishop's Book. By 1539, it was clear to Henry that the theological and doctrinal differences between Catholics and Protestants had hardened and the situation had grown even murkier. Henry realized that preserving his supremacy and securing peace in religious life was going to require uniformity. 
If he could not simply proclaim it, he would have to impose it by law. Thus, Henry first established a special committee of clergymen to deliberate on six doctrinal questions, the answers to which would form the basic articles of faith for the Church of England. Naturally, the committee knew what was expected of them, and they produced six articles of faith which essentially preserved the Catholic doctrines and observance with which Henry and many other conservatives in England were comfortably familiar. English Protestants were crushed, and it seemed that the only aspect of Catholic doctrine which the six articles had left out was allegiance to the Pope. This was what the Henrician Reformation was all about, creating a Catholic church where Henry, instead of the Pope, was the leader. These religious shifts and turns require some further explanation. Here, in 1539 and 1540, there seemed to be a tilt back to Catholicism. The reason for this was that Henry was never a Protestant. A doctrinal Catholic, he had allowed some Protestant reformers to acquire positions of authority within the English Church in the early 1530s, as they had facilitated his divorce. Then, he had allowed them to continue introducing a moderate form of Lutheranism in the mid-1530s as they enriched him through their proposal to dissolve the country's religious houses. But by the end of the decade, as the Protestant faction had nothing left to offer him, he reacted against the earlier reforms and essentially reimposed Catholicism, albeit while maintaining the split from Rome and his own supremacy over the Church of England. This final shift in 1539 and 1540 would be the last major one of the Henrician Reformation. Henceforth, the Church remained doctrinally Catholic down to the end of the reign, and a more thoroughgoing Protestant Reformation would have to wait until the next reign. All of this was overseen by a monarch who appeared increasingly tyrannical in the 1530s. Henry was widely appreciated as a generous and good-humoured monarch in his early days, but later in life he was often regarded as a bully with a hideous temper. There is a fairly concrete explanation for this change of temperament, which is that Henry was in almost constant pain with an ongoing disability. On the 24th of January, 1536, two days before Anne Boleyn miscarried her last child and five months before her execution, the still vigorous 45-year-old Henry suffered a terrible accident in the jousting lists when he fell from his horse. The heavily armoured horse then fell on Henry, nearly crushing his leg, and he was unconscious for several hours. When he awoke, he would find that his life had changed forever. His accident had opened an older wound on his leg, which over time became ever more ulcerated. Part of the problem was that 16th century physicians believed that wounds should be left open to allow the pus to continue draining from them, the buildup of which according to the humoral theory of medicine that prevailed at the time, could cause illness. Many of the treatments Henry was subjected to over the remaining ten years of his life probably did more harm than good, causing increasing infections and inflammation. In an age before effective pain relief, his health issues led to a more dour, obese and ill-tempered monarch with the king drinking more to dull the pain in his leg and also gaining a dramatic amount of weight. It is speculated he weighed well over 300 pounds later in his life and had to be carried around court in a reinforced litter. Henry's marriage to Jane Seymour later that same year and her pregnancy seven months later likely brightened Henry's hopes for the future. Henry and Jane had only been married about 15 months when she gave birth to Prince Edward. This 
seemingly set the seal on all of Henry's long-held ambitions for a male heir. But, tragically, Jane would only live for another two weeks, dying of puerperal fever after Edward's birth. While overjoyed at the birth of a son, Henry was crushed by Jane's death. Whether it was because she had given him the male heir that he had so long desired, or because they had not been married long enough for Henry's love to fade, the king went into deepest mourning and seclusion. He would not marry again for more than two years. However, both Henry and his courtiers understood that just one son was not enough to guarantee the security of the throne. After all, Henry had himself become king as his older brother had died prematurely. Thus, people soon began urging him to remarry again and produce a spare heir. Henry's fourth wife was Anne of Cleves, a German princess and sister to the Duke of Cleves. Marriage negotiations were entered into as part of efforts to end England's international isolation by negotiating an alliance with the Schmalkaldic League, an association of small Lutheran principalities in Germany. Henry commissioned the great Tudor court painter Hans Holbein to go to Germany and paint Anne's portrait. When he received Holbein's depiction of her, Henry admired Anne's beauty and poise, but when she arrived in person to England, Henry expressed intense disappointment screaming abuse at Thomas Cromwell and exclaiming, I like her not. Yet, because he had already alienated predominantly Catholic Europe, Henry did not wish to offend his new German allies, and so he duly married Anne of Cleves on the 6th of January 1540. But as the Catholic reaction against the Protestant reforms continued in the weeks that followed, Henry immediately began to seek avenues to have the marriage annulled. She has evil smells about her, Henry insisted after the wedding night, seemingly ignoring his own stench from his ulcerated leg. He also claimed that the, quote, looseness of her breasts and other tokens indicated that she was not a virgin. Within six months, Henry had his marriage to Anne annulled on the grounds of her supposedly binding pre-contract to marry the son of the Duke of Lorraine. Anne fared better than most of Henry's wives. She accepted the annulment with grace, and Henry gifted her an estate and an annual income. She would live the remainder of her life in England. Henry then imprisoned his Lord Privy Seal, Thomas Cromwell, in the tower for his mishandling of the king's marriage. Cromwell was beheaded on the 28th of July, 1540. On the same day, Henry married the niece of the Duke of Norfolk, 17-year-old Catherine Howard. Like Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard has been depicted poorly. Her behavior does, however, tell us much about the marriage to the king. Henry was 51 years old when he married Catherine and growing older, sicker, and heavier all the time. There were rumors also of his impotence. Some historians have speculated that such sexual problems might have formed the basis of Henry's failure to consummate his marriage to Anne of Cleves as well. Under these circumstances, it is hardly surprising that the teenaged Catherine found her new role as queen tedious, unrewarding, even lonely. She began an affair with Thomas Culpeper, one of the royal grooms, arranging clandestine meetings, writing him love letters, and sending him gifts. Rumors of her behavior soon began to circulate, and it eventually came to light that she had also engaged in a sexual relationship with her private secretary, Francis Derham, before marrying the king. Catherine would pay the ultimate price for the mistakes of her tragically short life, as she was beheaded on the 13th of February 1542 at the age of 19, the day after the executions of both Culpepper and Derham. 
the political shifts and turns of the reign were not entirely confined to England. Henry, for instance, incorporated Wales more fully into the English state through legislation passed in the 1530s and early 1540s. More substantial still were developments in Ireland. The English lordship had first emerged here owing to a partial conquest of the island in the 12th and 13th centuries. But the civil wars of the 15th century had weakened English rule. Though Henry had contemplated leading an army to Ireland at various points in the 1510s and 1520s, he never did so, ultimately considering any money spent in Ireland to be wasted. He had no choice, though, but to act when the son of the Earl of Kildare revolted in 1534. In the aftermath of this, a coterie of officials in Dublin convinced the government that a more interventionist program of gradual conquest of the independent Irish lordships was desirable to reaffirm English power in Ireland. Hence, in 1541, Henry became the first English King of Ireland when an act for the kingly title was passed through the Irish Parliament. All his predecessors had held the inferior title of Lord of Ireland. This ensured a commitment to expanding English rule on the island and a major programme of conquest and colonisation would be entered into from 1546 onwards with huge consequences for the course of Irish history. On the 12th of July, 1543, Henry married his sixth and final wife, Catherine Parr. She was attractive, twice widowed, educated and highly intelligent. The 31-year-old Catherine seemed a good match for Henry. She was a mature, sensible woman who made a marked effort to be a mother to Henry's three children and encouraged a much closer family environment. It was at this time that Henry decided to reinstate his daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, whom he had previously declared to be illegitimate, to the line of succession after his son Edward. Henry and Catherine seemed to enjoy both a cooperative and companionable marriage, and when Henry launched yet another invasion of France in 1544, he made Catherine regent in his absence a clear endorsement of his trust in her. While they were a seemingly good match, they did clash over religious matters. Catherine Parr was a committed Protestant reformer. She published no less than three books, all of which testified to her religious convictions. Her second book, Prayers and Meditations, published in 1545, was the first book published by an English queen in her own name. Her writings did not endear her to the more conservative religious elements at court, many of whose prejudices Henry himself shared. Catherine did not publish her third book, The Lamentation of a Sinner, until after Henry's death. The final major act of Henry's reign was his new war with France. This was again a part of a wider war between the Spanish and Austrian Habsburgs and the French. It also became the most substantial of the three wars Henry fought against King Francis I of France. There were two key aspects to this. Firstly, Henry squandered basically the entire enormous financial windfall he had received from the dissolution of the monasteries in sending an army to France, one which achieved nothing other than capturing the town of Boulogne, south of Calais. It would be governed as a new English enclave there for a few years, before being handed back to the French. The second element of the war, which was more substantial in some ways, became Henry's efforts to bludgeon the Scots into making their infant queen, Mary I, who had succeeded her father, James V, when she was just a week old, in December 1542, marry Prince Edward. Henry's goal in pursuing what became known as the rough wooing 
was to try and unite Scotland under England by having the children of Edward and Mary one day rule over a united Britain. The war with the Scots was still in full swing when Henry died, and the rough wooing would eventually fail, like virtually every other element of Henry's foreign policy during his long reign. By late 1546, Henry had become increasingly ill, and after making a few final adjustments to his will, he withdrew from public view into seclusion at Whitehall Palace. His condition deteriorated steadily over the month of January 1547, yet Henry's physicians feared to inform him of their strong suspicion that he was dying. On the evening of the 27th of January 1547, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was summoned to hear Henry's last confession. By the time Cranmer arrived, he found that the king's condition was such that he was unable to speak. Cranmer comforted the king by asking if he trusted in God. In reply, the king squeezed Cranmer's hand. Henry died in the early hours of the morning of the 28th of January 1547 at 55 years of age. It was, in many ways, a fitting end to his life and the strange religious changes that occurred during his reign, the Catholic monarch being given the last rites by a Protestant archbishop. With the king's passing, his son by Jane Seymour became King Edward VI. Clearly, as a nine-year-old, he would be unable to rule in his own right for several years. In the interim, his government would be dominated first by his uncle, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, as regent until early 1550, and then by John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, thereafter. The boy king was surrounded by Protestant reformers, and in the late 1540s a much more thorough Protestant Reformation was entered into, one which saw English churches stripped of their wealth and idolatrous adornments, the Bible made widely available in English, and a new Book of Common Prayer issued as a way for English men and women to engage with God's Word directly. Archbishop Cranmer, who Henry had raised to such heights in the 1530s, was the architect of much of this. Ultimately, it was a short-lived effort at a radical Calvinist reformation, as Edward died in the summer of 1553 at just 15 years of age. A brief effort to install Lady Jane Grey, a grandniece of Henry VIII as Edward's successor by the Protestant party at court, in the two weeks following the death of Henry's son, proved unsuccessful. With this, Mary Tudor, Henry's daughter by Catherine of Aragon, came to the throne. Those present as Queen Mary was crowned at Westminster on the 1st of October 1553 must have wondered what Henry's actions had all been for. Here was his daughter by Catherine of Aragon being crowned as Queen of England after all. Yet, five years later, it made a kind of sense when Mary died too and her half-sister, Elizabeth, daughter of Anne Boleyn, ascended as Queen Elizabeth I. A Protestant, though a very moderate one, she oversaw the creation of an Anglican church that her father would have probably approved of. Henry's life and reign was a fascinating mixture of both the best and the worst of kingly behavior in early modern Europe. His reign held out high hopes initially and started well, with a happy marriage to Catherine of Aragon and efforts to reassert England's place as a major European power on the continent after the decline brought about by the Walls of the Roses in the 15th century. Guided by figures like Cardinal Wolsey and Thomas More, Henry was a revered king and a defender of the Roman Catholic Church. The turning point came in the mid-1520s, as it became clear that his marriage to Catherine would not produce the desired male heir. Henry's father's shadow must be considered in all of this. 
Henry VII's presence from the grave ever warning his son to ensure the preservation of the House of Tudor's precarious hold on the throne by having a healthy, legitimate son. Over the next decade, Henry VIII tore England apart in pursuit of this goal, splitting from Rome and allowing the inception of an English Protestant Reformation, even though Henry himself remained a doctrinal Catholic. His worst inclinations were being followed by the 1530s, with the dissolution of the monasteries being entered into purely for financial reasons, inciting a massive popular revolt in the North in the process. One wife was divorced, two were executed, and another was cast aside almost as soon as Henry laid eyes on her. One, Jane Seymour, finally delivered him the son he had always sought, though it cost Jane her own life. The tragic irony of it all was that the son in question, Edward VI, would only live for six years after Henry himself. A half a century of female rule followed, and England did just fine without a male monarch. What do you think of King Henry VIII? Was he a brutal tyrant? Or was his concern for producing a male heir at all costs understandable given the civil wars which had racked England for so long in the 15th century? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for watching People Profiles Documentaries. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to hit the bell icon to get notifications so you never miss an upload. If you would like to watch our videos with no adverts of any kind, listen to audio podcast versions of our videos, discuss history with other People Profiles fans, and much, much more, go to peopleprofiles.com and become a member for as little as $2 per month. Members can also receive discounted merchandise, behind-the-scenes material, and a credit in our videos, along with much more. So, please support us in our work in return for exclusive offers at peopleprofiles.com via the link in the video description. Thank you very much for watching.